Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Thank you all for being patient as I am still recovering from COVID, but I got my voice back, so that's all that matters. <laughs> anyway, if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing and setting your notification bell to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video. Also, if you would like to learn how to become a member of Back to Ashes, that information can be found down below. Without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Creepy Encounters. Right after this intro, there will be an ad, or read the first story, there will be an ad, and after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Oh, and one more thing. If my voice sounds really like vocal fry or deeper than usual, it's because I'm getting over COVID. So I'm just really thankful that I can actually talk today instead of coughing my lungs out. Anyway, on with today's tales. There is this street dog near my college campus that I see every day. It is one of the older dogs, so it is always sleeping and very calm in general. I live very near to the college, and my friend and me usually go for a walk late night after dinner. Tonight was no different, and we were walking around the same route. It is a residential area, so we have never felt unsafe since there are always college students or other families out on the road walking around. We were on our third lap, and this dog was sitting at its usual spot. While we were walking past it, I was gushing about how cute it is and was clearly distracted. Suddenly, my friend said that there was a weird car behind us. I turned around to see that there was, in fact, a car driving at a really slow speed. The car pivoted towards us, which made me think that maybe it wanted to park where we were walking and might just be a random family only. As I was about to convey these assumptions to my friend, we hear a dog barking and turn around to see it chasing after the car. Both me and my friend are scared of dogs, so she stood behind me, hoping I would save her, but right when I turned around, it was the same street dog. I knew right away it wouldn't harm us. The car suddenly sped past us, and the dog didn't chase us or anything. Instead, just stood on guard. When we recovered from the shock of it all, we both had the same realization that the dog might have just saved us. We still don't know if that car had any evil intentions, but the way it sped past when the dog started barking, the timing of it all was just too bizarre. Plus, it was driving so slow that both of us didn't realize until it was so close to us. Needless to say, that dog will be getting extra pets from me every time I see it. So, when I was 17, I had just gotten my first car. One day, I drove my brother and myself to the dentist. While we were waiting in the lobby, I noticed someone had parked really badly right next to my car. Since it was new, I was pretty paranoid about it getting scratched or worse. My brother went in for his appointment and I decided to go move the car to a safer spot. After I parked in a new spot, I was walking back to the office. Just before I could cross the parking lot to go inside, a minivan with super tinted windows, like so tinted they had this weird blue effect to them pulled up so close to me that it almost hit me i thought it was strange but i just walked around it as i was heading to the door i caught my reflection in the glass and noticed a guy getting out of the van and starting to follow me at first i didn't think much of it and just started walking faster but then he started running after me that's when i realized Okay, this is actually happening. And I started running too. I barely made it to the door before he could grab me. The door was glass and I could see his reflection. He was reaching out like inches away from me. 
He looked like a totally regular guy, wearing a button-up shirt and khakis, which made the whole thing even more surreal. I ran inside, and he didn't follow, probably because he didn't want to be seen. I was completely shocked and kind of in denial about what just happened because it all went down so fast. I looked out of the window and saw him holding a purple cloth in his hand. No idea what that was about. He looked around, then got back in the minivan and sped off. I told the receptionist, but I was still pretty shaken up and confused. The whole thing happened in less than a minute. I've wondered what would have happened to me if I hadn't have ran. This happened several years ago. While it may not be as scary as other stories, it was definitely one of the most terrifying and bizarre encounters I've ever had. I live in the rural Midwest. I was born and raised in my hometown, and with the exception of a few months of living with my father on the East Coast, I've lived here my entire life. I've become pretty acquainted with the majority of the back roads in my area. One such road is an old highway that no longer has the traffic of days prior to the construction of the interstate that runs through the town. It's a long and winding road that offers gorgeous scenic views during the day and a quiet escape from the city at night. Along the road is a small lot with no more than 10 parking spaces, two picnic tables, and a single trash can. It's easy to miss due to the heavily wooded area surrounding it and the majority of the rest of the drive to it. Due to its secluded nature, it had played host to a fair share of teenage debauchery. I myself spent many a Friday night smoking away with my friends. Needless to say, there were a lot of good memories attached to this place, and over the years, it's become one of my favorite spots to venture to when I need peace or solidarity. One night, about five years ago, my girlfriend and I were going through a rough patch. We had a big fight due to having to work early in the morning and her deciding to have a party full of her loud and intoxicated friends. Things escalated quickly and I stormed out of the house and started driving towards my favorite spot. As soon as I was out of city limits, I promptly cranked my angriest metal music and sped down the road, chain smoking my menthols in an effort to calm down until I finally found the turnoff for the spot. I was happy to find no other cars in the lot, meaning I wouldn't awkwardly stumble upon two lovers engaged in the act. I immediately jumped out of the car and sat down at one of the picnic tables, lit a cigarette and stared up at the stars. I sat there for several minutes until I decided to head back to the warmth of my car after hearing some rustling coming from the woods. Not wanting to become a chew toy for a coyote or an angry bobcat, I hustled back to my car and blared my music again, quickly forgetting the sounds I had just heard. I decided to have one more smoke and then make my way home. I smoked it halfway through when out of nowhere, I heard pounding coming from the passenger side of my car. I looked over to see a large hand beating against the window. I turned down my music that was still blaring, and as I did, I can hear a very angry voice shouting, Open the effing door! while yanking on the door handle. Thankfully, my doors were locked, and after a few moments, the man disappeared from the passenger side, and then reappeared out the driver's side window, while screaming and cursing at me to open the door. He was now punching my window, trying to get in. I was frozen in a mix of confusion and fear, but eventually snapped out of it and threw the car in reverse. It was so dark I didn't get a good look at the guy, except for a split second. He was illuminated by my headlights. He had a black zip-up hoodie with a hood up, a dark gray t-shirt, and a ball cap. He was a stocky guy and had to be well over six feet tall as he towered over my Sonata. The only distinguishing feature I could make out was a very large, dark beard. I noped out of there really quick. I floored it across the parking lot and back towards the highway. That's when I heard it. A loud bang that sounded like a gunshot. 
I slammed my foot on the pedal, took the first turn I could find. Once I was sure no one was following me, I slowed down and realized I was doing 90 on a gravel road. At the time, one of my best friends worked for a nearby gas station, so I made my way to tell him the entire story. I looked over my car thoroughly and found a couple of dents on top of the car and what looked like a boot print on my passenger door. We talked it over and ultimately decided not to call the police. It's a 20-minute drive to the location from the closest town. We were sure that the guy would most likely be gone by the time anyone got all the way out there. Yes, I realized this was probably ignorant of me in hindsight. I'm still baffled by this encounter. I don't know if the guy wanted to rob me, steal my car, or worse, but I'm glad I made it home in one piece, and I hope I never meet that maniac ever again. Hello there. I'm sharing my story for the first time. Myself and my children were returning to my car after a very successful cinema trip. Despicable me four, it's all right. All in high spirits. Older two on either side of me, five-year-old is holding my hand. It was a relatively late showing, so we got to the car park at around 7.30 p.m. Not late at all in the UK, in the height of summer, a boiling day too, this is important to remember. It's a typical multi-story car park in the city center of a smaller city, but it's relatively open space with big arcs and decent lighting. Only two exits on that side, then one we walk through and one about 50 spaces up, so quite a way. Anyway, as we enter, I just feel eyes on me. You know that uncomfortable, I'm being watched without knowing it kind of thing? I do a quick recce and see a guy dressed head to toe in a heavy coat, trousers, and beanie hat walking directly toward me with very strong eye contact. Clothing observation might not be relevant as car park does have a... Clothing observation might not be relevant as car parks does have a few homeless people hanging out in it because it's cooler and sheltered, and a guy being in full cold weather gear would, I assume, be homeless. Completely non-judgmental observation, by the way. The speed and direction he's walking means there is literally no other pathway than out of the car park and over the bridge towards the town center. We proceed to the car, which is halfway into the car park, which is about half full. I noticed almost immediately that our man has not gone out of the car park, but taken a sharp right and is walking parallel along the first row of cars. His speed had changed to match the slower pace set by the smallest, and he has his body angled oddly away from us, but with his eyes quite clearly on us, just not direct eye contact. Head angled towards us just enough that I can see his left eye. My inner warning system is going mental at this point. Immediately, I tell both kids to stay close, and by this time, my son has also clocked the guy and is giving me a look along the lines of, Are you seeing this? We still have a bit to go, and annoyingly, I use my husband's car, which on top of being a pain in the ass for car seat access, also makes a real obnoxious beeping when you unlock it. It's parked alone on the last row with cars parked on it. Further past it there is a ramp to the other level. The car isn't at all a family-style car. However, there's also a minivan near us, which I can tell the guy has assumed is mine, whereas he's heading as he's going to stop around and approach from the back whilst I'm putting a five-year-old in her seat. It's what I could do. I keep my eyes on our man and tell the older two that as soon as we get to the car to get in quickly and shut the doors. Don't panic. Just one of my do-as-I-say orders. At this point, middle child has also clocked the man and keeps looking at me for reassurance because, and I can't stress this enough for anyone thinking I'm just some super panicked, frail woman, the guy looks like a predator circling his prey. 
The way the car park is set up with exits, there is zero reason for someone to be walking the direction he is. His path leads him literally straight towards empty car parking spaces and a wall. As we approach the car, the guy has pulled slightly further forward than us, but still keeping visual. His chin is in line with his left shoulder, which in hindsight is hilarious, as that must have been bloody uncomfortable to maintain for the two to three minutes of walking. As I unlock the stupid beeping twat car, he makes full eye contact with me, makes another sharp right, following the next row of the cars and circling around towards us in an arc. As soon as he gets around, so he's on the driver's side, he starts to beeline it at us. Kids get in as quickly as they can, doing a fantastic job of following what I say. And within five seconds, we are in, doors closed and locked. If it had taken any longer, the guy would have been on us. As soon as the door lock click, the guy immediately makes a sharp left and walks directly away from the car in the direction he came from originally. So he's done a big ass loop around the car park, passing two exits in the process. As we start to pull away, he stops and watches us the entire time before again turning and going back to the exit I first passed him at. Obviously, this then prompted a bit talk with the kids about safety, opportunism, and trusting your gut along with how proud I was of them for listening and following what I asked of them. I did explain that it was probably nothing more nefarious than a guy seeing a small woman outnumbered by kids as an easy target for a mugging or distraction robbery, and that it was luckily really badly executed. My son raised the point that I power lift and you could probably have him, and I had to again remind him that knives are a thing and even without one, a man, especially a man likely to be on drugs, would still probably mess me up really bad. And to remember, no one would expect a parent to engage like that with their kids present, and my Google Pixel 7 is not worth traumatizing them over. It's the shittiest thing in the world, though, to have to admit to your kids that you aren't the strong hero type they think you are. I do also have to point out that this isn't the first time I've been approached in an almost empty car park. For anyone who's like, oh, you're just paranoid. I've had a man try to open my passenger door handle and another almost empty big open car park in full daylight whilst I was reading a book in my car, waiting for someone. He walked across the entire car park straight at me and tried the handle. The car was locked. He looked surprised. I yelled at him, and he rapidly walked off and got picked up by another guy in a car waiting behind the hedge opposite. And justifying the whole hatred for cars which beep or flash when they unlock, if you are being followed, they are a beacon for your expected destination. Not so recently, had my train delayed, got in at around 11 p.m., so it's obviously dark and all that, disembarked with about four other people, and I unlocked my car quite far back. Man walking along the opposite side of the cars further forward literally stopped behind my vehicle, so I had to walk past it and loop back, and as soon as I had passed it, he carried on through the car park. Maybe innocent? Hell of a coinky dink. If so, though. Either way, I wasn't going to find out. Also, I had been stalked before, and once, a taxi driver tried to kidnap me right after a night out when I was 18. Luckily, I didn't drink, so I'd say I have good reason to be as hyper-vigilant as I am. I don't even really know why I'm justifying it, to be honest. This was many years ago, maybe when I was 20 or 21. I was assaulted, went out jogging in a park while on vacation, someplace north in Ontario. It was deep in the woods. I was listening to music, alone. I should have been more careful. There was this guy with a blue dirt bike at the entrance to the trail who was acting really creepy and suspicious. 
He kept trying to start conversations with me as I was unpacking my stuff and getting ready. He kept asking things like, where did you come from? Or, you work out? When I was changing my shoes, he asked me for my shoe size, and I immediately thought he was a creep. I just lightly chatted with him and kept my gaze down. I was wearing a hat, so it would hopefully hide my face. Nearly half an hour of jogging and sightseeing, I saw the blue bike again. It was parked off to the side, and I remember the feeling like a lump in my stomach suddenly formed, and I thought for sure that guy was probably ahead to try something. I was on the main path for the whole way since, but considering he was sitting there, I decided to backtrack a little and take the nearest side path to avoid the encounter. Five minutes into the side path, there was this narrow spot in the trees that led onto an old concrete square. I think it was like a water reservoir or foundation or something. I wasn't thinking and just kept going. Here's a trigger warning for all of you. I stepped into this black adhesive stuff on the other side of a lip of concrete. My shoes were completely stuck. It was like some kind of tar or glue. I don't have no idea. I didn't know what it was and just assumed it was something from the structure, like leftover construction stuff or something. I spent a couple of minutes just trying to work my shoes out, but eventually had to take them off for better leverage. Then I saw the man. He came towards me. I just felt panicked. I was going to get my bear spray when he said he was just there to help. I didn't want to potentially aggravate him or do something that could get me into trouble. So I just stood back and let him try to get my shoes out. I noticed that he was just pretending that he couldn't get them out. And I remembered what he said about my shoe size and thought something was off. So I backed away and considered spraying him. It happened so fast. He turned around and slapped my foot with the black stuff. I stumbled trying to get back. I missed the spray and he was wrestling it out of my hand. I tried a knee in the groin. He released me and off I ran. I got my socks off and was going to run, but he just had more of that crap. He had some metal bucket of that black stuff. He was slapping handfuls of it on my feet. I couldn't kick him and it was difficult to move. I was screaming and hitting him as best as I could. I'm sorry if this is too much detail. He was telling me to shut up and used it on my mouth. He pushed me to the ground, took my backpack, and just continued sticking the stuff to my body, and I was frozen in fear. I heard a buzzing sound, and I knew what it was without seeing it. I began struggling to get up or kick him or do something. My clothes were pinned and my arms too. I'm not going to give details, but... He used a vibrator on me. I was crying, stretching it as far as I could. If I got an arm almost out, he would add more. I rarely ever masturbated at the time, so suffice it to say, it was over stimulation. He didn't undress me apart from my pack and socks and didn't use his penis anywhere. So I'm at least grateful of that. He just kept buzzing me and fondling my body with the black stuff, asking things like, do you like it or does it feel good? It was probably around an hour of that, and he was recording the entire thing. I just let him do whatever until I found a way out or someone came along. Then he brought this towel to my nose. It was fuming and some chemical. I was thrashing and trying to scream. Somebody heard, I guess, and shouted. I don't remember much. Time was all fuzzy. Felt like I was falling on a roller coaster. When I got my thoughts back together, it was getting dark, and I was alone. I spent a long time getting out without ripping my clothes and scraping that stuff off of my body where it was on skin. I still don't know what it was, but Googling it, suggested bird lime or construction adhesive. It was also apparently a type of fetish. So 
So yeah, I walked back to my car. There was nobody there at night. And I just drove back to my cabin and sat there in the bath, not even turn the water on, just sitting there, thinking of what had just happened, trying to get as much stuff off of me before I washed myself. My feet and other parts around my belly were stained black for a couple of weeks. And that night, I just lay there, silent. Even now, just touching stuff like soap brings back that time. And I can't help but feel weird by slimy feelings of it. I'm wondering if anyone's had similar experiences or encountered anything with this black adhesive. This happened a few years ago in Upper Ontario on a semi-official hiking trail. I really don't remember much of what happened during or after the assault, possibly because of whatever fumes I was exposed to. I remember driving very slowly because I was still feeling off balance. In hindsight, I probably shouldn't have been driving, but there was no traffic out that late. I'm still a little shaken from this, so apologies if certain spots in my story don't make sense. I live on the outskirts of one of the largest cities in the Northeast, in a quiet section of the city with a small town feel. I go to a gym in the suburbs and was headed home after a pretty intense workout, ready to get home, pet my dog, and take a much-needed shower. Now. To get back to my section of the city from the suburbs, there is an old four-lane bridge that leads into a few of the main streets of the neighborhood. The lanes aren't separated by markings, but there are signs on the bridge and everyone respects the two cars to a lane policy. As I was driving across the bridge, I stayed in the right lane to go straight across, as the left lane is the turn lane. As I reached the end of the lane, I noticed that the car at the end was over into my lane by about a foot, and I did my best to cut around him. One of my tires ended up a bit up on the sidewalk as I made my way into my lane. I glanced over at this guy, didn't flip him off or act aggressively, but I'm sure my face expressed my thought of, what the hell are you doing? The light turned green and I went straight across and noticed that the car that had been blocking my lane, the spot being in the turning lane, went straight as well. Looking at my rearview mirror, I could see an illuminated Uber light in his windshield. I continued up this semi-residential street, stopping at each stop sign on my way up, this car remaining behind me the entire way. As I was already thinking, this guy doesn't know how to drive. I keep an eye on my rear view as I approached another main street in the area. As I was waiting at the light, I noticed that this guy had turned his Uber light off, and something in me realized that something was terribly wrong. I'm not sure what it was, but that Uber light gave me some sort of comfort that this guy was working, and his conscious act of turning it off made me really uneasy. As I turned onto the main street, I made the first left turn I could, and the Uber made the turn behind me. I was now on a residential street, but as I knew the area, I drove at a conscious pace, making a couple of turns heading toward the highway. The Uber pursued, his bumper about a foot and a half from mine. Halfway down the residential street, there was no doubt in my mind that I was being pursued. Now. Despite having a very button-up office job and soft-spoken personality, I don't necessarily think I'm a prime target for being chased. I'm a big guy. I'm between 6'5 and 6'6, a little under 220 pounds, muscular, and have a ton of tattoos. I'm sure this guy saw me as I pulled up next to him on the bridge, and from my glance at him, he looked older and much smaller than myself. While the thought of pulling over and escalating things did cross my mind, with the rate of gun crime in my city, that thought was gone as soon as it came. 
All I could focus on was getting to a safe place and making sure this maniac didn't find out where I lived. As I turned onto the highway, he followed again, cutting across several lanes and accelerating to catch up to me. I made the first right I was able to, then led him down a winding maze of back streets, his car inches from my bumper the entire time. I wasn't paying attention to one ways, stop signs, or speed limits at this point. I just knew I needed to get away from this maniac. All the while, the Uber followed, matching my speed and taking every sharp turn I did through the maze of streets. Realizing that I needed to get back to a more populated area in case this guy decided to shoot me or hit my car, I headed back in the direction of the main street spotting out of the corner of my eye the parking lot of a fast food restaurant that provided a shortcut to the main road. I blasted through the parking lot, this man speeding in after me, and I felt hopeless. If this guy was willing to follow me through all of that, he wouldn't stop until he caught me. I weighed my options as I turned onto the main street. Police department was about a 10-minute drive away, but there were several lights and crosswalks between myself and safety. I decided that I would head through the back streets in that direction, trying my best to lose him as I went. I didn't want to give this guy an opportunity to get out of his car at a red light and hurt me in some way. I had to head in that direction and pray that I didn't hit any red lights. As I rounded the corner out of the parking lot, my worst-case scenario was revealed. A red light with a car already stopped, opposing traffic. I don't one way to my left with a car, ready to make a turn. I know it was irresponsible, but I didn't hesitate. I merged into the oncoming lane and made a left going the wrong way down a one-way residential street. A few beeps from other cars around me rang out, but I didn't care. I just prayed that I had made an irresponsible enough maneuver to throw this guy off and created enough confusion to get away. I looked in my rear view and didn't see headlights. I drove to the end of the block of the one way. I made a few random turns down side streets, pulling into the parking lot of an apartment complex and turning my car off. My adrenaline was winding down, and I could not stop shaking. I laid my seat all the way back and called the police non-emergency line. The lady who answered the phone was entirely unhelpful and directed me to call 911. All I had was a brief description of the car and guy whose face I could not recall well. The police told me they were just going to write it up as a disturbance. They told me to drive home. As some time had passed between the chase ending and their getting to me. Being the ever paranoid person that I am, I parked several blocks down from my house, changed clothes in my car, put on a hat and walked home, on the lookout for this guy and his car the entire time. I thought I saw his car turn left down another block as I walked, but I told myself that, even if it was him, he wouldn't be able to recognize me outside of my car. Now, as I'm home typing out all of this, my large dog next to me and a drink in my hand, I feel helpless. I'm scared to drive my car in the city and run into this crazy person, scared of what he might do to me. I'm worried this guy will drive around and see my car, find out where I live and try to come after me or my family in some way. I've never felt this vulnerable before in my entire life. I've never considered purchasing a weapon, legally that is. But this encounter is making me consider it. All I can do now is try to move on and hope that he doesn't get any rides in this area. In 2018, I moved into a small two-story apartment in England with my then-boyfriend. It was in a quiet cul-de-sac with houses crammed together, all facing each other. I am very introverted and don't typically make a habit of socializing much with the neighbors. Since we naturally ran into a few and exchanged pleasantries, 
as you would, right? One of our new neighbors, Greg, was incredibly welcoming right off the bat. He was an older gentleman, the kind who'd stop you for a chat that would drag on and on until you made up an excuse for why you really had to get along. He shared local stories, asked about and took note of our birthdays, and even invited us around for a garden party where any and all are welcome. His house was directly across the street from where I lived, with his windows in clear view of mine. A couple of years passed by, and during this time, my boyfriend and I split up. Although I never expressly shared the news with my neighbors, word must have gotten around with his car missing from the driveway. He moved out and left the country, but we stayed in touch regularly as friends. Having the house to myself felt lonely, so I got a cat to keep me company. He quickly became, and still is, my world. Greg would often flag me down to talk when he caught me leaving or returning to my house. Annoying, but I could live with it. I'd update my ex about weird little interactions with Greg, which we both found amusing to gossip about. One such incident was when Greg came to my door to hand over two of my parcels, one of which was a large table that he had yet to retrieve from his house. I had been raiding in Elder Scrolls online at the time, doing a deathless speedrun for an achievement. Given the time constant in my game, I told him I'd leave the door unlocked so that he could simply put it by my door. I sat back down at my desk, put my headset on, and my group charged in at the final boss. I heard my front door opening, followed by the sound of my large parcel being placed down. Then, footsteps approached me from behind. I peered behind me to see Greg standing there, eyes fixed on me. For fear of disappointing my raid group, I continued playing until we killed the boss and then took off my headset. Greg's face lit up and he went on to tell me how amazing it was to watch me play. I got the impression he'd never seen someone use a keyboard, let alone play games. He begged me to teach him and rambled on. He was clearly intoxicated, so I laughed it off and gave a non-committal response. Despite repeated attempts to politely ask him to leave, he could not be persuaded. He seemed disappointed when I walked over to my door and opened it, to clearly signal it was time to go, but he left without further incident. In the UK, houses often have individual outdoor bins for trash, which have to be rolled out to the street the night before collections take place. You're expected to bring the bins back to your property after collection. I noticed someone kept bringing my bins back in for me. Was I blocking someone's car by being too slow to do it? Around the same time, I also noticed someone had been using my bins. I brought it up to Greg one time. He pulled me over to talk, and he said the same thing had been happening to him. Maybe it was petty of me, but I decided to tape an old phone with a surveillance app to my window overlooking the bins to figure out who it was. Lo and behold, it was Greg. I chalked it up to him having run out of his bin space after the local council moved from weekly to bi-weekly collections due to staffing shortages. Although it bothered me, my desire to avoid confrontation won in the end. Christmas rolled around and the COVID-19 pandemic was in full swing. One late evening, I heard a knock at my door and walked over to see who it was. I had no people, so I opened the door not knowing what to expect. Greg stood at my doorstep, which was not particularly unusual. I'd gotten all too used to his antics. I immediately caught a strong waft of alcohol, but he spoke before I had time to process. He told me he had a Christmas present for me and handed over a red gift bag with colored tissue paper covering the contents. I really want to give you a kiss on the cheek, but I can't. Not with this pandemic going around, he said. That gave me the heebie-jeebies, so I did all I could to politely end this interaction and retreat back inside. He held me up by rambling on about God knows what. 
I firmly told him that I was busy and needed to go. That's when he laid a hand on my shoulder, leaned in, kissed my cheek, and then walked off into the direction of his house. I closed the door and simply stood there for a few moments in shock. The present was odd. Underneath the tissue paper were two bottles of Belgian beer, a can of half-eaten Pringles, sour cream and onion, and a small plastic bag containing little chocolates. I recognized the latter item. A next-door neighbor with young children had come around to put these little plastic bags with chocolate and a handwritten note, signed with their address, through everyone's mail slots a few weeks prior. It was a sweet gesture and probably something they came up with to keep their stir-crazy kids busy. Upon inspecting the regifted chocolates, I noticed he had forgotten to remove the note from the neighbor. This kiss and gift gave me bad vibes, and I regretted accepting it. I decided I was done being mispolite and resolved to being firm in my future rejections. On the second day of the new year, I was feeling lazy and ordered food delivery. A mere five minutes after receiving my order, there was a knock at my door. Knowing the delivery driver hadn't forgotten anything, I concluded this had to be Greg. And then it clicked for me. He'd often turn up immediately after anything was delivered to my door. He was constantly watching my house. Was he dumping trash in my bins as an excuse to hang around my house? He called out for me through the door. I felt too uncomfortable to answer and retreated upstairs out of view of the windows. Later that night, he came back and kept knocking, but once again, I ignored it in hopes of him going away. The following day, I contacted the police to file a harassment report. I felt sheepish doing so. Was it really that bad? He was just a lonely old man and I hadn't been firm enough. Upon being asked whether I wanted the police to speak with him, I told them I'd do it myself. I just wanted the report on file in case anything else should happen. I would later become grateful for filing that report. Greg turned up at my door a few days later, telling me how worried he was about me. I told him, verbatim, I think it's best if we don't have any contact going forward. His response was eerie. I just wanted to be your friend. I held my ground, cut the conversation short, and shut the door. Finally, it was over. Or so I thought. A year went by without incident. Everything seemed fine, with no knocks on the door or unwanted conversations while I was outside. One night in winter, I was leaving my house to get groceries. It was completely dark outside, save for a lamppost, casting some sparse light onto the street. My driveway was at the side of my house, where the bins were stored. The driveway was blocked in by a tall panel fence to add some privacy, seeing as the kitchen windows was directly next to it. You could see right into my kitchen and living room through that window. As I was outside locking the door, I saw a figure in the dark slinking out of my driveway and behind the fence. I immediately unlocked the door and went back inside. It was dark. I could have imagined it, but my gut told me otherwise. Was there someone waiting for me behind the fence? Ultimately, I trusted my instincts and decided to forego the groceries for the night. I bought and mounted a motion sensor light to illuminate my driveway. The memory of the shadow figure quickly faded into my mind and the new light gave me some comfort that I'd at least be alerted if someone was lurking outside my window. A couple of months after the incident, I was in my kitchen getting some food for my beloved cat. The window was directly to my left, around three feet away from where I stood. As I dumped the cat food into a bowl, I suddenly became aware of my motion sensor light being on. I scanned the outside, not seeing anything, until my eye landed on something in the bottom corner of the window. I squinted, trying to make out what I was looking at. It somehow wasn't properly illuminated. I kept staring for what must have been 30 seconds. 
the light outside remained on. Suddenly, Greg pops up into view directly outside. He had been crouched down, peering in from the corner of the window. I'm normally someone who's cool as a cucumber. I never raise my voice or yell, but I truly lost it at that moment, screaming, What are you doing? Repeatedly. He just stood there, then nonchalantly asked, Are you all right? I kept screaming, but now it was, Why are you there? He walked off into the dark. I immediately called the police. Typically, the police in England leave something to be desired, but I have to give them credit for how they handled the situation. They took my statement over the phone and gave me a reference number. I received a couple of phone calls with updates and was told they'd bring him to the station. I was also informed that he was known to the police for having previously following young women. Sometime later, he was arrested at his property in front of a wife I didn't even knew existed. They did this to scare him, according to the officer I spoke to. To make a point, sadly, he received nothing more than a police caution, which forbade him from being on my side of the cul-de-sac or contacting me. Still, it seemed to work. The window incident was the last real interaction I ever had with Greg. I did see him staring at me in the shower from his window one time when I forgot to close the blinds, but nothing else. I have since moved far, far away. About a month ago, me and five of my friends went up to my cabin. We arrived late Wednesday night to stay Thursday, Friday, and leave on Saturday. For context, my cabin is about an hour and 40 minutes out of the city off a random highway down at the end of a dirt road and down a steep hill. I'm saying this because I want you to know it's not the easiest to just find or stumble across unless you knew about it. We have neighbors and whatnot nearby, which we all know pretty well and have never had issues with. Now that that's out of the way, I'll get to Friday night. Jade and Soup leave the cabin and go back to the city. I make dinner for the rest of us. We all hang outside for a little bit and drink and whatnot. At some point, one of my friends, Rose, knocks on the glass patio door, and then my friend Joey jokingly knocks back. Bobby, who's pretty superstitious, starts to kind of freak out and say, Y'all don't do that. It attracts stuff. It's almost 2 a.m. What the hell? Were you in the woods? Some time passes and my friend Rose mentions that we still hadn't had a fire or used the s'more stuff we bought while shopping for the trip. After a couple shots and a smoke, we all bug spray up, grab our needed materials, and head out through the patio. When you go out to the patio, you step onto a raised deck. It's about 10 feet off the ground and wraps around three-fourths of the cabin, getting closer to the ground as you get to the front door. About halfway, there's stairs that lead down to our lawn and a small beach as it's on the lake. We've got the fire pit and then a shed and shooting area behind it. Lastly, and most importantly, off to the side, passing the fire pit, is a somewhat grown-in path that attaches to a bigger beach that belongs to a private beach association. As we go outside and head down the stairs, me leading everyone with my phone's flashlight, at 10%, because, of course, I start to get a bad feeling, which I brush off and tell myself, it's fine, it's because it's 2 a.m., you're just scared because it's dark. As we get down to the fire, me and Bobby start to collect wood, sticks, and sawdust from the ground nearby. It's kind of windy, and waves are crashing on the shore, but as I'm gathering, I swear I hear a twig snap or something in the bushes. Ignore it. Move on. I'm bent down, passing wood to Rose to place into the fire. When I think I hear someone cough, or, like, clear their throat, I feel I'm being watched. Same spot in the woods. Ignore it. Move on. Except when I looked, I noticed Bobby was looking too, which meant Bobby 
heard it too. Whatever. Ignore it. Bobby is collecting sticks and goes, Oh God, I gotta wash my hands when we get inside. We all ask why, and he shows us a snapped animal bone on the ground, pointing right towards the direction of the path. The path we walked all day and didn't see a bone on once. Fire is going, Rose is making her s'mores. I am freaked out, and I know Bobby is freaked out too. I pull out my notes app. Did you hear someone? And walk over to him discreetly, showing him the phone. Yes, he types. At this point, both our eyes keep being drawn to that path to the beach. Eventually, we hear noises all around us. I hear something run across the beach and into a bush. We hear kids laughing between the waves, the wind blowing. We hear something in the bushes by the shed and shooting area. Although our eyes keep being drawn to the path, to the private beach, I open my notes and write, We need to go on the app to show it to Bobby, not wanting whatever is there to know what we were saying. Bobby is crouched down watching the path, holding a huge stick like a bat, ready to swing. I have a marshmallow roaster in between my hand like it's a shiv, and Rose is over here asking us what kind of s'more she should make next. She eventually makes another, and we start to kind of hint at them that we need to go inside. At some point, Bobby stands up and gets closer to the path. He asks me for my phone, which is now at 5%, shines it at the woods and the path. Suddenly, he hands me my phone, looks at us, and goes, Go upstairs right now. Rose grabs her things, but can't find her lighter, to which Bobby yells, To hell with your lighter! Go! We kick the fire out and head up back to the cabin as quickly as possible, locking ourselves inside and barricading the doors. We sit down and ask Bobby what he saw. I looked at the path with your flash and I saw someone's shoulder and neck and the bottom of their chin. They were crouched down in the bushes, skinny and pale. Our blood ran cold, and we sat in that kitchen for two hours, each with a knife in hand. We each went to bed with a knife. About 20 minutes after me, Bobby and Joey fall asleep. Dale hears something banging around outside. Come morning, when we went to investigate, there was nothing to be found. I don't know what or who was in those woods watching us, but even if it was human, which I don't think it was, no normal person is watching a group of people from the woods at 2, almost 3 a.m. I've had a few good encounters over the years, but today I'll share this one in particular. So, this happened back in my late teens. I was likely around 16 to 17 years old when this happened. Growing up, I was always a bit of a recluse and kept to myself. My friend circle was small, and I was bullied over everything under the sun. Pretty stereotypical, shy, introverted, and troubled kid. I also grew up pretty straight-laced. My parents and older siblings had addictions to smoking, drinking, and harder drugs. To me, I had actively seen what it did to people and decided early on to stay away from those things as much as possible. When I got to my older teens, I loosened up a bit, but still didn't really partake. I smoked a cigarette once. I hated it. I drank beer once. I hated it. My mom was always really open when it came to if her kids wanted to experiment. She would always say, If you're going to smoke or drink, I'd prefer that you do it in the house instead of at a party or with friends. Luckily for her, I was a pretty mild-mannered child compared to my older and younger siblings. So that meant that if I ever wanted to try something, she was pretty open to letting me get away with it. So when it came to New Year's Eve, I had interest in trying a mixed drink. Like mentioned before, I had tried a sip of beer and absolutely hated it, but I did think fruity drinks would be good especially interested in trying a fuzzy navel. My mom obliged, 
grabbed some for herself to have and made me one drink to enjoy during the night. Since I didn't have friends to hang out with, nor did I care much for the end of one crappy year shifting into the next, I just spent my time as I usually did, which was to play video games. I'd been lucky enough to have my own TV and console in my room to play whatever I wanted to. But because I was a paranoid kid with little experience in drinking, I wanted to be downstairs where my family was, near and I was close to the only bathroom in the house in case I needed to throw up. I lugged my PS2 downstairs and set myself up in our sunroom. This was during a cold winter when I had lived there, so there was snow. So I was essentially in a fishbowl. Three of the four walls were lined with half wall glass, side by side, looking out into the darkness of the country night. On the far left of the room, where I was maybe three feet away from, was the door that led outside. The sunroom faces the road, which is maybe 30 to 40 feet away. I fired up the kerosene heater, wrapped myself in blankets with my little drink, and delved into some RPG. I had my one drink and spent a couple of hours playing video games. It was likely close to midnight because I remember celebrating with the rest of my family in the main part of the house after this. But I was sitting in a dark room with the light of the TV illuminating me and was pretty much in that fishbowl. Like any good gamer, I was fully invested in what was happening on the screen, so I had no idea how long they were there for. Out of the corner of my eye, I heard a sudden noise, the slap of a hand harshly against a window glass. With it being both winter and an old house, the glass made a strange wobbly noise. I immediately jumped and darted my eyes toward the sound. However, from looking at a bright screen in a dark room for hours to suddenly trying to figure out what was going on while looking at a dark window, my eyes did this weird thing thing where I couldn't really make out any features. I just saw a pale white guy grinning really intensely. I like to believe that I tend to react decently well in panic situations. Shortly after making myself known, like maybe two seconds, he took off. I shoved myself up from my spot as he began to run away, went two rooms over to where my elder brother was playing on his computer and shakily told him that a guy was outside the window and just scared me. He immediately grabbed his gun and ran outside. Armed with my brother, I also went outside with him. I'm ridiculously curious and can get really bolstered when I have support. The pair of us went out and around the house. We saw the footsteps in the snow, a track from the road to the window, and then a more rushed pair away from the house. However, we saw no person. We also didn't see or hear any cars. Even when I first stood up after being scared, I didn't see a car's headlight. Obviously, after this, I just went back inside and decided I was no longer going to be playing video games at night in the sunroom ever again. I spent the rest of the night in a well-lit room surrounded by family and celebrated the new year properly with a second drink. There's just so many weird thoughts to this that I've thought of over the years. Who was out there at that time? Was he drunk? Was he driving drunk and decided this was going to be a funny prank? Or was he just walking around at 11 p.m. on New Year's Eve in the country? Did he just have an impulse moment because he could see a light on in a relatively dark home? How long was he watching me? What else was he doing while he was watching me? What was the point of scaring me? Just for the reaction? I saw his hand and heard the sound of that slap. Why didn't he have any gloves? If he had a car, did he park his car in a driveway somewhere? Or was his car just turned off in the middle of the street so he could do this? He was only two windows length away from the door that led to me. Had he had any darker intentions, he could have easily opened that door and gotten inside. My parents were listening to some TV show loudly in their room, way over to the other side of the house, and my brother always plays on the computer with noise-canceling headphones. 
This is the part that scares me the most. Even though it obviously never happened, was likely never his intention, and this all was probably just a prank. Sometimes the thought of what could have happened is scarier than the actual scare. Not knowing the intention behind someone's thoughts and actions is what gets me the most. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true creepy encounters. I wanted to record some more, but unfortunately, I'm still fighting COVID and my voice keeps changing and it's making the recording weird. So thank you so much for waiting on me and still supporting the channel. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes along with the gifted memberships. Donna, Matt Davies, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Calmin Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Chrissy Elias, Denise S., Tina Mead, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Jova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, Haunted, and Anita B. Thank you all so much for remaining the pillars of which this channel relies upon. I can't say it enough. I appreciate each and every last one of you. Thank you. And now our gifted memberships. The Conspiracy Archives, Grimm's Library, Adam Gregg, and The Cryptid Sleeps. Thank you all so much for your support. I really do appreciate it. To the other subscribers or first-time listeners, thank you so much for stopping by and listening to this video. It really helps the channel out. Plus, if there was no you, there would be no me. With all of that being said, if you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.